Hello everyone, my name is Yaolin Faino. I'm a research scientist from Howard University. Hi, my name is Susie Armstrong. I'm a senior vice president of engineering at Qualcomm. Hi, I'm Elliot Douglas. I am program director for engineering education at the National Science Foundation. Hi, I'm Sarah Nadari. I'm a ThinkBit Lab instructor at Qualcomm. Please join us in conversation. ThinkBit Lab is a makerspace and a classroom kind of collided. It's like an art store and electronic store collided, and um, the idea is to let kids explore what engineering is and what it means to them. So it's a medium. Uh, we try to provide engineering experiences that allow kids to realize that it's a medium to create. Um, what that means is up to them. So whether that is building spaceships or um, or interactive art structures or um, if it's fashion or robotics or if it's smartphones. Um, that's the engineering component to it, but there's also uh, one day, it's, there's also another component to it where the kids understand the world of work and the ecosystems that enable these engineering uh, companies to succeed. So what does that ecosystem look like um, and how do they uh, find themselves in, in that ecosystem? Um, so it's providing kind of like a, I, I think, a very well-rounded experience of uh, not just engineering, but the world that surrounds it. I think, I think that's why makerspaces are getting to be more popular. And like at the undergrad level, I think the problem is that it's all focused on solving a problem. Right. Like you take thermodynamics, it's like, okay, calculate this thing. And it's not always, not often, well connected to that creativity kind of stuff. And, and we need more ways to people to understand what engineering really is. As a, it's, not, it's not like sitting at your desk doing calculations. Or as Sarah says, sitting in a closet yeah, <laughs> doing yeah, yeah, yeah. calculations. Right. Right. And, and I think that's why uh, ThinkBit in San Diego has been so successful and we're so excited about um, what Virginia Tech will bring to it out here in the DC metropolitan area because um, it's very uh, it's very hands-on it's very project oriented we are Qualcomm we are technologists we're not necessarily educators mm -hmm. but um, it's uh, you know it plays on a number of things that Qualcomm is interested in um, philanthropy of course um, but also uh, STEM education for min minorities and women uh, STEM exposure and also creativity, right? Because out of creativity comes invention, and out of invention comes patents, and this is a major part of U.S. competitiveness and, and uh, Qualcomm's as well. Plus, it makes you smile. <laughs> yeah, I agree. It's a very competitive world, new ideas, new technologies, and new talent coming out every day. So as like engineer educators, we really need to get out a new, a new method to teach engineering like what you guys did, and then to promote these ideas for crea creativity for students. Like in Howard, we have, some, we have tried several methods to promote this kind of creativity. Like, uh, for example, we have, uh, uh, we try to fill in the gap between how we teach engineer and how engineering is really practiced in the real world. It's not only problem sol solving, like what you yeah. said. It's like a really uh, diversity, there is diversity in it. Uh, so we want, we use like online, uh, classes will co collaborate with different universities, with Virginia Tech, for example. Like students at Howard can choose classes from Virginia mm. Tech. Like we, we are very small like institution. We don't have the resource to build it up. So we reach out to, to get more resources I from. I to come visit. <laughs> yeah, of course, you're welcome. Yeah. Well, you said something interesting. You said something about coming up with ways to better teach engineering. And I think from my perspective, so I, my programs fund mostly fundamental foundational research in engineering education across the entire spectrum of ages and contexts and things like that. Um, and I think we actually know what to do to teach engineering. The problem is getting it, and I'm talking about the university college level now, the problem is getting, getting it implemented in a way. And the problem is the last you know, 10, 15 years, the model has been you know, the single classroom, I'm the faculty member, and I am a faculty member also at the University of Florida, so I've, I've done these Gators. things. Go Gators, that's Sorry. right. <laughs> um, 
Wait, maybe I lost my train of thought. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. that's okay. Me too. So, oh, so you have the single faculty member, like, who decides I'm going to implement something. Like, everyone talks about the flipped classroom now, or whatever the other different kinds of approaches are: inquiry-based learning, project-based learning. But it, it stays in that one classroom and doesn't spread. So we've started a program called Revolutionizing Engineering and Computer Science Departments, and these are two million dollars for a department to make a revolutionary change but the key thing is that they have to make a they have to address issues of culture it has to be department wide they have to address issues of culture so what i say is everybody in the department faculty student staff should be thinking differently about what it means to have an engineering mechanical engineering program or environmental or whatever it is they should be thinking differently about what it even means so that you start to come up with all kinds of different ways of doing it and and when you do that it doesn't make sense anymore to have a lecture class in thermodynamics or statics or whatever you know you, you're doing these things differently does that, does that include like could that include like interdisciplinary maybe uh, departments mixing together like an art department humanities yeah. department working with the computer science department working with the engineering department yeah and and really collaborating together I mean I feel like uh, there needs to be a revival of the Renaissance period, you know, and really merging these uh, departments to start, because at the end of the day, like you're saying, if it's if it's not just about problem solving, it's uh, how do you use engineering as a, like a, to apply it in some real world way, um, and what are they going to be applied to, but these other departments as well, right? Mm -hmm. It's not engineering doesn't live in engineering engineering lives in the world right so um, yeah and that goes into another topic so there are things like that I don't know that anyone's actually formally working with an with a humanities department but there are things for example uh, projects at University of San Diego is called change making engineers so they're infusing social justice issues throughout right. their curriculum so students understand community Oregon State um, the Get the chemical, biological, environmental engineering department. They're doing something similar. Um, so there's a whole range of things. Some are working more with industry. So Boise State Computer Science, they're doing something where it's like a different approach to working with industry. It's going to be like a more real world software hmm. industry environment. But but what you say is another thing is people are talking now about integrative learning as opposed to general education and there's some schools that just in terms of their they're changing their general education requirement so it's not just like you know a pick one from this category and pick one from this category and pick one, you know it's how you integrate them and that would do if you could integrate that with engineering that would do a lot of things to stimulate the more socio-technical thinking that right. it is not just about problem solving Right, and I think what we found in Thinkabit, um, especially in, we run one and two week classes during the summer, which are longer than you know our one day exposure experience. And what we found there is um, kids want, it doesn't matter whether you're in sixth grade or whether you're 57, uh, people, <laughs> want, people want to actually work on real world, world problems before, before they actually necessarily get into the real world. And so, you know, when you you have a project and the, the students decide to you know address uh, global warming or or the impact of global warming, you um, you really in, engage kids even beyond you know the the cute uh, colors and and the back background. So this whole move of the education industry, if you will, towards um, project-based learning and and actually creating um, something that that is uh, applicable to. Our, our lives, I think, is a is a hugely good move, and I think it really captures um, kids who might ne not necessarily uh, before go into STEM and STEAM and uh, these kinds mm -hmm. of industries. Um, do you, do you do things like that at Howard? Yeah, and I totally agree with you. Like uh, last year, I teach a, a senior a senior level uh, engineering class, and. Uh, I give them a project from the beginning of the uh, class, uh, tell them to solve a real world problem and develop a paper on it. Uh, so I give them several topics like how can we get better water quality, as in DC area we have the water quality <laughs> problem. <laughs> and the kids really, really love mm -hmm. it. And they reach out, they spend three months trying to dig in like uh, how to really develop it. And then uh, one, one of the students, they, they lead him to a job in DC water. <laughs> so. Oh, <that's laughs> 
Yeah, yeah. So I feel like uh, you uh, use like a contemporary examples, like uh, the real projects they really interested in engage students for uh, engineering career is very right. important. And I love the fact that the technology now both supports and needs um, these kinds of cross-functional people and and engineers. Um, you know, with the Internet of Things, when you mentioned the water quality monitoring, you know, the sensors that are available for flow analysis and for water quality and getting those sensors connected together, you know, to more easily and regularly report back. These are the kinds of projects that tie in, you know, smart cities, smart kids, smart universities. Uh, so I think it's a really good t time um, now to apply some of these um, innovative project-based uh, learning skills. Well, I think even going deeper than, than that in terms of real world, it's, it's community projects. And what, by that I mean, I don't mean going out, because here's the problem, right? Engineers can sometimes be like, I'm the engineer, here's, here's the solution that you didn't even know you had a problem for <laughs> me to, right? So, anxiety. Yeah, so going out into the, going out with the community and, and using the community as partners where they are mm -hmm. telling you what their needs are, what the solutions could be, and, and then the engineering, the engineers or the engineering students in this case, just say, okay, there's a solution, how can we make that happen? As opposed to saying, I'm here, to, I'm here to help you. So people that are interested in applying to your programs, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, it's not just about developing the program, but also monitoring the effectiveness of that program as well, right? So yes. It, be, and that's, it can't just be like a CS department. It has to be probably a CS department coupled with an education component or Yeah, or yeah, yeah. That. So it's the department people. There has to be a CS or engineering education expert. Right. And then there needs to be a social science expert on organizational change because that's that's sort of the cultural piece is understanding how the organizational change happens, and, and that's and what's I, different. When because we've done things like this before at NSF, we had in the late 2000s department level reform, but it didn't have all those pieces. It was just like we're going to make everything they have flipped classrooms then, but we're going to make everything project based learning, and those were somewhat successful locally, but they didn't spread. That's the other thing we're really trying to do with this is create a national cohort so that the all the project teams are not isolated. They're actually, um, we have a team that's facilitating, the, facilitating their interactions. They have monthly telephone calls. And when they get mature enough, we're going to try to roll out some things so that other departments can take what they're using. I, I appreciate the identifying the idea of like um, working with the community, you know, mm -hmm. asking the questions with the community, right. allowing them to drive you as you drive with them. And it's just this exchange that starts happening. Um, and, and I guess, you know, maybe uh, figuring out is there kind of a, a general method in which people can do that in, um, and allowing the time for that to come to fruition yeah. as well, right? Yeah, the problem is it's the, you probably know this, right? It's like, you know, I have to cover everything, right? Yes. Yes. And the so, basics of first. Yeah, and the basics. And so, so there's, a, there's always that, that tension. I think, and I've been at NSF for a little over a year, I, I think I've become more of a radical in terms of that goes, like, in terms of like, who cares about the content? Not, not, I, I mean. We, we know what you mean. Yeah, yeah right, so, so, you know, I pull back that way because other people are pulling more, I can tell you stories from various faculty I've heard say, like, no, we can't implement a three credit course in our 30 credit masters because that will dilute the program. We should have more specialized courses, not this course on, on how to read the literature. Hmm. Right, and so, so I, I, I probably that's why I say I'm a radical. I pull more probably than is the ideal, but we have to get away from this idea that we need to cover all the content. We need to instill the values and, and the thinking about what it is to yeah. be an engineer. Yeah, yeah, because it's a problem solving. It's not it's not the necessarily the the content you learn. It's how mm -hmm. it's how you approach a problem or how you approach an idea. Yeah. Yeah, it's like uh, what the company, engineering company, they need, uh, like for the engineers. For example, one of my students come back to me, he's like, I tried to get an interview from a company, but they want uh, me to have like a programming ability as an environmental engineer. It's like, uh, this is not, uh, this is not an old wheel requirement for engineers. They need to be specialized on certain area, right? Like, uh, for example, uh, like what you said, you, you don't have to be, have a, like a really general idea. You need to have a general idea of what engineering is, but you have to have your specialty. Yes. 
but it is it's about identity and about thinking like an engineer like you were mm -hmm. saying as opposed to knowing how yep. to do all the calculations. And trying to be culturally inclusive. Mm -hmm. and, as, and, and, and that's really, I think, important too, because I always feel like uh, being culturally inclusive allows a better range of innovation and a better range of creativity, and there, the, the, you know, the best will rise. But if we're isolating it and not being open to trying to be inclusive, I think it just limits ourselves, mm -hmm. right? And uh, I, like you're saying, Susie, it's, no, it's it's a great time. It, was, it should have been way back when how to do that, but you know, uh, at the end of the day, it's nice that we're starting. Right? Let's do it now. Yeah, mm -hmm. let's do yeah. it now. Why wait? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, like a lot of faculty, they, they don't have, I mean, after they teach like certain years, they have their uh, teaching style like fixed. They don't have the motivation to change. But support from NSF, like the funding <laughs> grant opportunities, is a good uh, pro like promotion for yeah, faculty. Yeah, that's, that's the leverage that we have, right? We, we, we can give money, and so then that gets people motivated. So one thing that we found, that I've always found in my, my career, you know, you go through school, at least I went through school, and you work pretty much by yourself. Sometimes you have a lab partner, and so you work in, in pairs. And in the real world, you know, you work with not only multiple different people, you know, there's 65,000 lines of code in a typical high-end cell phone. You don't work with all those people. Mm -hmm. 65 million, sorry. <laughs> Uh, and uh, uh, I think it's it's really important for kids to work to work in groups. And the only w realistic way to work in groups is to actually have those those kinds of projects to to work on. Because you know study groups, uh, you know where you're reading papers together, don't necessarily uh, um, work for that. So my idea is. The four of us should should form a project group, and we're not going to make you fund it. <laughs> <laughs> we're out of money for the yeah, year. Yeah, exactly. Actually. We're done. But wouldn't that be a great cross-functional project? You know, the think of it people, the engineers, the from Howard University and from NSF to try to pu pull something together with Arlington County, uh, and the c city of Arlington and Falls Church and think a bit to um, I don't know what it is. Uh, uh, but to pull together a project where we could um, um, put together a little course or put together a little project, whether it's for university kids or it's for sixth graders that we're serving in the in the Think of It lab, um, because out of those kinds of my point is out of those kinds of projects come an incredible number of ideas. Um, I came, you know, from engineering. I really had nothing to do with education <laughs> uh, until I moved into uh, this group, and the, the group moved under under me. And it's uh, created um, not only a wonderful thing for the company and hopefully for the communities, but uh, it's created a wonderful thing for me in terms of where we can apply, you know, Qualcomm's technology and and how we can inspire. Um, uh, students and teachers and counselors to um, get involved in this kind of uh, uh, STEM and uh, invention work. So you know, the problem is we're all engineers, right? And so <laughs> we'll, we'll invite other people. Okay. <laughs> it's, but but it's interesting. You were talking about Sarah about you know can we bring in like the artists, the humanities, and engineering? And the problem in academia is that it's so siloed. Right? And so, you know, accreditation, and there's some changes potentially coming, but at least as currently written, one of the required outcomes from our accrediting agency is working on multidisciplinary teams. So, so how do you define, how does your program end up defining multidisciplinary teams for that? Uh. Environmental engineering, as you know, it is interdisciplinary itself. In <laughs> so sense. sitting like uh, on the edge of several disciplines right. uh, and uh, civil, like uh, biology and yeah. uh, chemistry. So, but that's but that's what happened, and that's my point. Is that what hap That's what happens because of the silos. We end up sort of being forced to define multidisciplinary as like it's the soil person and the water person and the air person, and that's, that's the multidisciplinary. Right aspect of it. It's not an engineer with a business major, with a lawyer, with uh, you know, creative arts, you know, ad, you know, who wants to like, you know, come up with the, the ad design. Yeah. Which is my impression, and correct me if I'm wrong, but my impression, that's what's really what happens in industry. Yeah. 
Um, to, to some extent, um, but I think that's changing. And again, I'll bring up the Internet of, th of Things, and I'll mm -hmm. bring up um, biotech. And these, it, they're all, a lot of them are scientific fields and engineering fields, but there are so many cross-disciplinary -dip projects and jobs out there. Even your environmental scientists, being able to know and un understand how to program and, and uh, code, probably will serve that person well in the long run, even though they didn't get that yeah. job, <laughs> that interview the first time. Yeah. Um, so I think the, the, the time is also very um, right for these, these cross-disciplinary um, projects to pull together because, uh, again, biotech is the easy, is the easy one, but um, if you're gonna build you know, sensor networks for water flow, mm -hmm. you've gotta understand something mm -hmm. about you know, fluid dynamics and water flow, and you've got to understand something about, you know, probably programming and computer science yeah. as well. And then, you know, to think a bit, uh, so I claim I'm an artist as well as an engineer, <laughs> <laughs> and maybe a little bit of an educator, and I think the um, uh, projects that uh, pull in the arts is anybody here a, a musician? Um, I have been. There you go. Singing, there yeah. there you go. I can play three songs on the ukulele. <laughs> but the the point is is you don't have to in, in any of te these technology fields you don't have to necessarily strict stay strictly with technology. Um, we could put I don't know maybe we could make some sort of a synthesizer project. <laughs> actually actually I have what's essentially a minor although yeah. right went to school didn't have minors at the time so I have sort of this weird combined engineering and music degree. Yeah. One thing I l really love, and Sarah and I we were talking about this yesterday, one thing I really love about the maker movement is they have finally put a, a, a term to sort of these cross-functional um, projects where you, uh, because if you look at what people come up with in maker spaces and create, they're not necessarily, you know, programs for, for one single item. They bring in mechanical and they bring in uh, art sometimes and they bring in engineering and they bring in computer science. I think my biggest uh, learning moment, because uh, as an engineer, engineering student, um, I, I will admit that we were a bit of a snob and we felt like, you know, if you're not in college in sciences, why are you going to college? Um, <laughs> and so it was, it was that bad, I'll be, I'll be honest. Um, and uh, when I graduated, I felt like I wish I had more hands-on experiences. I started a little lab at this university. And um, my mentors were, one of them was the founder of the Ed Studies Department, and the other one was a cognitive science professor. These were the majors that we were making fun of, right? Uh, and my world just exploded. And I realized very quickly, um, especially with the cognitive science professor, that you know, even if you have the best uh, product, if you will, or the best programming, um, including that community or um, understanding where the community is at by asking questions was just as important because if the if the end game is to um, you know provide the service to whoever it may be, if you don't understand that audience or whoever may be using it, it could still fall flat. And so um, I suddenly appreciated the art, if you will, of organization, of how humans work together, how different cultures work together. Um, and uh, you know, recognizing that, acknowledging it, and then um, how do you adapt to that? And how do you then still design these products or um, programs or whatever it may be to suit the humans um, that they're going to be that are going to be using them? Because at the end of the day, all of our technology, all of anything that anyone's doing is for humans, right? To aid them in some form or fashion. And humans include all these cultures, and all these cultures are coming from fundamentally different places. They're different thought processes. I listen to a lot of Alan Watts, by the way, so I'm like on a big Alan Watts kick right now. So uh, you, know. you stumbled into that sort of accidentally, right? In a no. sense, right? And then so, I felt ashamed, yeah. by the way, of that mentality okay. I had as an undergrad. So one like, of our one of our red projects is uh, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, their biomedical engineering department, and part of their project is that they're going to teach the undergrad students ethnography um, in order to so that they learn how to go out and figure out what those needs are um, nice. for biomedical engineering. Nice. And is there an outcome from that project? No, because the f no that one was just funded this summer. So, so the first cohort, the first grants were made just over a year ago. So, really, where they are right now is they've been collecting sort of baseline data for the last year and prepping 
for their first real rollout of whatever they're doing with their curricula this fall. And then, and then the second group is just barely starting. And we're working on hopefully having another group after that. Nice. I think uh, just to add to this, uh, you know, one of the things I appreciate about working at Qualcomm is it does foster this environment of innovation and whatnot. And um, we do have departments actually dedicated to understanding the human element, uh, the user interface, oh, okay. the, the user experience, I'm sorry, yeah. department. And they actually, their, their goal and their cognitive science, um, PhDs in cognitive science, and whatnot, mm -hmm. working with engineers to make sure whatever they're developing is, is making sense for people, yeah. and I think that's really um, forward thinking. On, uh, on yeah, it doesn't matter, you know, how brilliant the technology if nobody <laughs> can figure out how to use it. Uh. <laughs> yeah. It's not uh, not useful, but uh, this is uh, it, it's a really wonderful opportunity to um, you know to meet uh, folks like you mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, you know, working again, work, working with Virginia Tech here is a really great opportunity. There's many touch points with us in, in Virginia Tech, uh, and it's a great opportunity to work with a, a top university and the faculty in, in both engineering and uh, sciences and also in the education department. So um, we are happy to be here, and I'd love to come visit you guys again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, you talk about your mind. Well, I felt that way. Yeah, after being at NSF, because yeah. you know you're a faculty member, yeah. you're doing your own little research, you're teaching your class, and then you, you go to NSF, and it's like I, I'll be honest, I started in June of last year, 2015. If you had asked me then what making was, I could not have told you. Hmm. Um, and so that's an example. I mean, just like the things that you learn, the the larger issues. So, like I'm gonna go back eventually to the University of Florida. I'm gonna be like. A, can't do the thing, same stuff I was doing before. Yeah. Well, I think uh, that's true for me as well. I, I, I loved engineering. I loved computer science. I, I did a lot of work on the mobile internet that makes you, you know, a zombie typing on your phone, <laughs> as my husband says. <laughs> um, uh, but, you know, moving into the policy area and then being able to be associated with the Think of It lab and um, trying to bring some of that technology to bear on. Uh, you know, exposing uh, students to to STEM. It's it's beyond workforce development. It's mm -hmm. it's uh, to me it's it's creative, and you're you're shaping you're shaping the world. So I don't look at my projects in the same way anymore either. Cool. Policy is a wonderful yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah and we are also learning the process, yeah. right? Like we need in innovation for our own job as well. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, one of my colleagues has uh, read a quote somewhere that um, sixth graders, I think, today will, through the course of their career, after they get out of university, will have at least 13 different kinds of jobs. Not just 13 different jobs, but 13 different mm. kinds of jobs. And so um, that's pretty amazing. You, you have to keep up, you have to build a great base, and you also have to, I think, whether you're a student or whether you're a, an engineer or um, or uh, somebody at NSF or an educator, you have to be open to the opportunities. You know, mm -hmm. you can't think this is what I'm going to do the rest of your life because exactly. you know suddenly yeah, the world is changing. So the much. world, the world changes, and um, you know, my, for myself, moving from engineering to our government affairs group and touching on education and uh, has been an incredible career change. Mm 